You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Um, as I said, guys, we're going into year two here. I wanted to branch out. I'm trying to be a lot better at not just doing the area I live. I want to try to do all of Virginia, Maryland, Chesapeake. And the, and the James River is something that the first year I completely spaced on. And I'm trying to do this on a monthly, bi-monthly basis to talk about this. And I'm fortunate enough to have another amazing guide, um, Rob England, uh, here that is going to talk to me about, you know, the James and a couple of other really cool things that we're talking about, you know, just before we got started here. Uh, Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And thank you for uh, having me and uh, thank you for the opportunity. No, I really appreciate uh, you reaching out, um, you know, and that's how, so I, I did my, uh, my first James River endeavor with, with Matt, uh, Matt fly fishing yep. and Rob reached out to me and, you know, that's how most, most of my guys and stuff, that's how this gets going here is they kind of reach out. I was like, can I get on the show? I was like, absolutely. Everyone has interesting knowledge and tidbits and before, and it's a really cool thing about just land permits that we're going to get into. And I didn't know any of this, and this is so fascinating to me, but before we, before we do that, Rob, how did you become a guide in this area? And just tell us a little bit about your history. Yeah, uh, so I, I grew up in Ohio um, and, and I've been fishing, you know, most, well, all my life, basically. Uh, I had, a, one of my grandfathers had a cabin on a, uh, a lake in Ohio. Uh, it's a natural lake called Indian Lake. And, uh, you know, when I, from the time I was probably four years old, I, I you know, I, my parents had pictures of me fishing and, uh, and, and my grandfather and my dad made it very special for me. So it's something that, you know, I've always been around and, uh, you know, I continue to fish and, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a avid hardcore sports fan. Um, so it was always, you know, sports and outdoors. And, um, so, you know, played a lot of, uh, you know, baseball and, and football and hockey, uh, growing up in Ohio. And when I, when I graduated, uh, from high school, I still, you know, I still wanted to play some football. And, um, you know, I, I'm only, I'm only five foot seven, about 180 pounds. So, you know, I wasn't going to Ohio state, which I love. So, uh, had an opportunity through some contacts and some, uh, some scouts, um, to, to come down to Ferrum. And, and I didn't even know where Ferrum college was. I had heard of Roanoke a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, I came down and fell in love with, with this area and at the time, Ferrum College was a junior college. So, you know, just a two year, I uh, got an associate's degree. And uh, during that time, um, you know, I lived down here. Uh, I started fishing. You know, I, I, so I worked, at a, I worked at a department store way back in, in the 80s called Hills Department Stores. They're not around anymore. Kind of like an early version of a Walmart. And some of the guys I worked with, you know, talked about the, the James River and the Mari River and the Jackson. And, you know, being able to catch a hundred smallmouth in a day. And I'm like, you gotta be crazy, man. There's no way, you know, I've never caught that many fish in a day. Well, sure enough, the first time I ever floated the James, I caught a hundred smallmouth and I'm like, I, I just, I fell in love with it. And it's so different from what I grew up, you know, the, the mountains, the, the pristine nature of these rivers, um, just the whole area. It's just, it's, it's just beautiful here. I just fell in love with it. So, I got recruited into the supermarket business out of college, um, worked for a food line, uh, a parent company called Del Hayes, uh, worked in their corporate office in Salisbury, North Carolina. I was in supply chain and uh, I was there for about 27 years. Unfortunately, it was part of a big layoff in 2013. Hmm. Um, and then I went to work for another company in supply chain, strategic sourcing, and did that for about five years. And uh, unfortunately, I went through another uh, a displacement. The company was a private equity group and and they ended up selling the company. And I was found found myself displaced twice in five years. So back up just a little bit back in in the 2005 range while I was at Food Line, uh, one of our big one of our big suppliers is PepsiCo Gatorade. And they would take me and another guy uh, that was a, you know, a category manager um, on a you know, fishing trip every year, you know, we'd go like three days and we'd go to the James or the new river. And, um, and again, I'd been fishing, you know, I, even though I was living down in North Carolina, I was still coming up here a lot. And, um, you know, we would got, we would go out with these guides and, and that's kind of when I did, determined that I, I could probably guide because 
you know, no disrespect to those guys. Great guys, young, young, young guys did a great job. But I, you know, I thought to myself every time I was out there, I'm like, I know these rivers better than these guys do. And I, I think I can do this. And I love it that much that, you know, I, I'd like to do that one day. So about 2008, while I was still working at Food Line, uh, I decided to start guiding part time. So I was driving all the way up here from, you know, Concord, North Carolina, just just north of Charlotte. Holy and, crap. It, and, and, you know, with all the years of experience I had, I had about seven weeks of, you know, PTO time. So I would drive up here like on a Thursday night and I would guide Friday, Saturday, and then I'd drive home on Sunday. Or sometimes I'd guide on Sunday and maybe I'd even take Monday off. Um, so that's how it kind of all got started. Um, and, you know, here I am 15 years later. Um, after that displacement with the private equity group and, you know, having been displaced twice in five years. Uh, I remember coming home that night and sitting down with my wife and said, what do you think about me, you know, going, you know, guiding full time and, and us moved to Virginia. And she said, let's do it. And you know, rest, rest is history. Wow. So what was your fishing experience like back in Ohio? Cause is, is that, so from the bass fishing scene of tournaments, everyone yep. complains about Ohio lakes and things of that oak. Um, like, did you do just fly fishing? Was there a lot of smallmouth fishing opportunities in Ohio? Like, what was that like? Yeah. So, um, in the Indian Lake, I mean, you, you know, we're talking about, you know, me growing up there in the seventies and, you know, in, in the eighties. So I didn't, I didn't see, you know, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't notice that there was a whole lot of tournament activity going on. Um, but you know, it was basically, you know, my, my grandfather had a boat and a, and a dock and, and I was fishing off that dock a lot, you know, a lot of bottom fishing, but one of the things that, that I, I used a lot uh, back in back in early days when I was fishing was live leeches, and really? yeah, and they're very hardy. And you know, I'd catch smallmouth, I'd catch largemouth, I'd catch small pike, I'd catch walleye. Um, and then you know, we had the Miami River that ran pretty close to my house that had pretty pretty uh, nice abundance of smallmouth. Uh, we had the uh, Mad River also had some smallmouth and some trout. Um, and then I had the little Miami. So I had some rivers, I had the lake and that's kind of how I got started. And I still kind of remember the day when I, I, I really wanted to start venturing out in a boat and start, uh, fishing with, uh, artificials. Uh, there was a guy, you know, very early version of a bass boat, probably late seventies. I was probably, you know, 14, 15 years old and I'm sitting on this dock all day and I was getting, you know, catching some fish. And this guy comes down this back channel where my, my grandfather's, uh, cabin was and i don't know what he was throwing he threw some kind of artificial lure right i mean literally on the dock that i'm i'm sitting on and pulls a bass right out from underneath the dock that i'm like that's what i want to do <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how it all got started oh that is so addicting I, it's so crazy we all remember like our first that moment that it just it hits us that yep we're going to be addicted to this for the rest of our lives now, with, with the smallmouth fishing um, in general in Ohio, did a lot of that translate to when you came down here? Because you talked about earlier about like those hundred fish days. Yep. Like, w was smallmouth fishing big in Ohio, or w when you came down here, was this just like Disneyland? Oh yeah, this was this was Disneyland. I mean, you know, smallmouth fishing was, you know, it was hard for me. You know, I didn't have the perspective then that I do now. You know, because you know there was a few you know guys on television. You know, you might have had Bill Dance and. Roland Martin and Jimmy Houston and some of those guys, but you know, with all, with you know hundreds of stations now, you can find fishing just about anywhere. So, uh, you know, really didn't hear a lot of people talking about you know fishing for smallmouth and you know catching, you know that those kinds of you know having those kinds of days. Um, but you know, back then, you know, I was pretty limited on what I was using when I started uh, with artificials. You know, it was like the the original floating Rapala and then the broken broken back Rapala. And then when I came down here and, you know, I, you know, I, I had my first opportunity to get out on the, you know, the upper James and the Jackson, and the Mari, again, that's what we were using, but it was so easy to catch fish here. I mean, smallmouth, you know, in that post spawn period between, you know, say the middle of May to the middle of June, you know, to the end of June. I mean, it's just, it's just craziness. And it was, it, it was, you know, it would have been hard not to catch fish. That's how, you know, how it was. I mean, smallmouth is just so, so aggressive. So, uh, very, very different. I mean, you know, a good day in Ohio, you know, 10, 15 fish, you know, especially when you're fishing from a dock, you know, wading in a stream, you know, like the Mad River or, 
uh, the little Miami, you know, didn't have a boat. So I didn't, I, I wasn't able to cover a whole lot of territory, but you know, when I got down here and started fishing with some guys and they had canoes and then there were places around here that you could rent canoes and, you know, go a whole day and cover, you know, seven, eight, nine miles. You know, it was fairly easy to catch a lot of fish. Now, did you also have trout and muskie that you grew up with, or was that an interesting transition when you guide for them? Um, that was an interesting transition. I, I, I had gone with uh, my uncle a couple times trout fishing, but didn't have a whole lot of success. Um, I had heard about muskie. Uh, now, I had caught some northern pike on Indian Lake, but fairly small, you know, talking in, you know, the 20 something inch range, not anything like the muskie that we catch, you know, on the rivers, you know, we, we were able to boat a 54 inch fish last year. So, you know, most of our muskie, I would say 80% of our muskie coming over 40 inches, which is a citation. So yeah, that was a kind of an evolution, you know, started out, you know, because I kind of cut my teeth on uh, smallmouth bass fishing. That's how kind of I started, how I started. And, you know, you know, hence the name of my, my company, Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures, which, you know, bronze backs are a, a nickname for smallmouth. And then, you know, as the time went on and, you know, I started catching them and I started going out myself and scouting for them, caught a lot of them accidentally. I was fishing for the, you know, smallmouth in terms of the muskie. And then uh, I have a guy, uh, a guy that guides with me um, and he's kind of my fishing partner. And he taught me how to kind of fish on the Jackson up there because uh, he's, you know, tied his own flies. And uh, started getting, you know, pretty comfortable and confident with being able to fish up there. And, and I gradually started adding those on to the guiding. So and now we have, you know, multiple species that we can offer and guide for. And that's actually a hell of a transition to the Jackson River because I, I've lived in Virginia my whole life. I didn't even know about these laws. And I, you know, <laughs> I'd really like just to kind of just for you to reiterate that again. So the Jackson is a very unique place when it comes to the land stuff. Like, could you talk about that some? Yeah, so um, so below Lake Moomaw, uh, we have Gathright Dam, and then uh, below Gathright, you know, which is tailwater, uh, we have 18 miles of wild trout water. And you know, in my opinion, catching a wild trout compared to a stock trout, there's no comparison. I mean, the the the, the colors for wild trout are much more vibrant. Um, you know, and the fish, you know, are born in the stream; they live there all their lives. And they fight the, the fight in a, in a wild fish. Again, no comparison to a stock fish, uh, extremely hard, uh, uh, you know, a lot of spirit in those fish. But um, to, to your question about the, the land uh, back back around the revolutionary you know, time, um, you know, Virginia was a very important state, not only, you know, in the Revolutionary War, but um, in the Civil War as well. But there were some landowners in this in, along the Jackson River that were granted what's called King's Grants. And to have a King's Grant means that you that they have rights to the to the stream bed uh, hmm. of the river. And in the King's Grant areas, which I think there are five or six, I, that number could be wrong, but um, they you cannot fish, you cannot wade and you cannot drop an anchor. And if you do and you are caught, those people are very, very serious about that. Um, and, and so much so uh, litigation has been brought against some anglers and in, in, in particular. And I can't remember the year exactly, but um, there were three anglers that were fishing out of a canoe, um, got out of their boat, waded the stream. The landowner approached them. Um, I think if they would have gone on their merry way. It, it probably, I mean, something might've happened, but they chose to have some words for the landowner. Oh God. Yeah. Which was, <laughs> which was a mistake. Um, and it ended up in, in court, um, and to the tune of a million dollar fine, which they were oh. found, they were found guilty. Yes. They were found guilty. Um, oh, God. and you know, one of, I guess, you know, uh, th th there's a lot of arguments on both sides and, um, you know, I can understand from an angler's point of view and people that, uh, you know, that want to fish. I mean, even though they they own the stream bed, they don't own the fish and they don't own the water. Um, so if I could uh, rewind a little bit back to. So uh, uh, 
Lake Mumaw was created, I think, around 1981, and that's when they put up Gathright Dam. And it served a couple different purposes. One, the paint, there's a huge paper plant in Covington called West Baco. And they needed some cold water processing. I don't know all the details, but, you know, they do uh, cardboard converting there. And they needed some cold water processing. So when they put that dam in there, that tail water, I mean, that water never gets above 60 degrees. You can go out there in the absolute heat of July or August, it can be 98 degrees. And that water is still going to be no more than 60 degrees. I mean, your legs will turn blue if you're wearing shorts. Um, so it, it, that was one uh, function. And while, when they did that, they said, okay, you know, we can, we can also create this trophy wild trout water. Um, well, they did not trout water initially. So they originally started stocking it. And because of the situation that I just met, mentioned with the litigation, and then there were, you know, constant arguments with uh, the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, uh, the, the Game Commission, the Game Wardens, uh, Trout Unlimited, Fishermen, that in 1993, uh, the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries just kind of finally threw up their hands and said, you know what? We're not we're not going to stock the stream anymore. We're 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 tired of all this. Um, they didn't even want to get involved when there would be cases. They didn't even want to come down there and, because it, it's such a you know it seems such such a great thing. Um, so hence you know I always believe everything happens for a reason. And uh, when they stopped stocking it, then lo and behold, they started to reproduce, and we get this tremendous wild trout fishery. And um, so. Yeah, that's kind of where we are today. Um, the King's Grants that are closest to the dam. So when, when you're at Gathright Dam, the first three quarters of a mile is public. And yeah, you can yeah. actually you can actually launch down there. And that's really, really good fishing right below the dam. But once you get about three quarter mile downstream, then you're going to be in King's Grant waters. Pretty much all the way until you get to what's called Johnson Springs. And that's that's a that, that's an access right there at Johnson Springs, and you have uh, from from there uh, you have Johnson Springs, you have Smith Bridge access. So I got the Smith Bridge right here up on Google Earth. Yeah, we're sharing. Yeah. So this starts the the King's Landing. Uh, no, it, you have the, the King's Grants uh, are are between Gathright Dam and Johnson Springs. Okay, so up a little bit higher. I gotcha. Yeah. So. It's, it really doesn't, I mean, to float that section of water really is kind of wasting your time because you can't fish, you can't anchor, and you can't wade. I mean, if a kayaker wants to put in there and just float, I mean, they can float. Um, but whenever I'm guiding, uh, I, I won't put up put in any farther up than Johnson Springs. Um, gotcha. That's good information. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But even after Johnson, there's probably two or three more um uh king's grants along the way they're not they're not large properties there are signs you have to look for them um i mean you know they're 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 there uh, sometimes you can miss them i wouldn't say they're extremely obvious but um you know you you can see them now one of the wild cards in this and one of the things that causes me some heartburn and some and some fishermen are there, there are some landowners up there along the Jackson River that are not King's Grants, and they have put up signs to make it look like they're King's Grants because they just simply don't want people fishing there. Which and and there's no enforcement, which is which is a shame because for folks that aren't you know educated on the details, you know they might be missing out on a great fishing opportunity simply because somebody says that it's King's Grants and it's really not. But if you know the details. The signs for the King's Grants can only be issued by, I think, the National Forest Service or something. And, and that is so stupid, though, that uh, it is 2023. It? Yeah. And could we, like, get this shit up to date a little bit so everyone knows what to do? Because people, generally speaking, don't want to break the law. Right. But this right. is just, and it's a pain for you to try to make a living. Yeah. Yeah. I know where they are because uh, there's there's a there's an app that you can get. You may have heard of it. It's called On X Hunt. Mm. And it started out as a fish, uh, a hunting app. So hunters wouldn't wander on or go, go hunting on private property. And now they've extended it for fishing too. So I did have some, I did have some guy approach me a couple of years ago and said, sir, you're on, 
uh, I had clients that actually had to go to the bathroom. So, you know, they had to get out, uh, had to get out of the boat. And this guy approached us and, and we did decide to fish there for a moment. Um, he said, sir, you're on King's Grant. I said, uh, no, I'm not. And I know exactly where I'm at. And I, and I showed him and he still insisted. I'm like, I wasn't going to argue with him. I didn't want to cause any problems. And you know, I didn't want to make it uncomfortable for my clients. So we just got in the boat and went on our way. I don't understand. Like, so <laughs> I, I know in Loudoun County, Virginia, where I, I live, like people bought land next to a youth baseball field that had lights and they bought it. And then as soon as they bought the land, they started to complain about the lights being on when kids have games. And it's like, why do you, this is all on you. You did this. Like, <laughs> yeah. Why would you buy land next to a youth baseball field and then bitch at they have lights on this place when you did this? Why would you buy land right next to this? It's like, you just want confrontation. It right. makes no sense. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Um, and, and then you also mentioned, I just want to make sure. So you're not, if a kid or someone wants to like fish by the shore near the dam, that's not allowed or is allowed. No, that's allowed. That's like, okay. yeah, you've got, you've got public fishing for about three quarters of a mile. Okay, cool. And, 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 and you can wade in there. Uh, you have to be careful, you know, cause you know, you know, depend, I mean, there's, they they typically only release large sums of water when we've had a lot of rain, um, but you just have to check the water gauges and know what the water you know water level is. And unfortunately, there's a uh, there's a uh, uh, an invasive um, algae called didymo hmm. that, that's kind of down there by the dam and a little ways down the river, and it can make it very very slippery. Um, so you just have to be careful, just like you would any time when you're when you're waiting, but uh, if, if you want to, you know, if, if, if you, uh, you know, want to try to catch some, you know, fish, some, you know, I mean, there's some big fish too down there, um, in that first three quarter miles, it, there's, there's some great opportunities to catch, uh, some numbers of fish as well as size. Now, before we, uh, we, we move on and we put a pin in the Jackson river, if people wanted to go out with you to specifically fish the Jackson, when would you suggest they book a trip with you? Well, it's coming up. I mean, I would say, you know, here toward uh, the, the end of March. Uh, uh, so with wild fish, you know, they they spawn um, and the rainbows will spawn in April. So we're going to be we're moving into the pre-spawn uh, for um, uh, for rainbow trout and the browns don't spawn until late fall. So typically latter part of uh, October. But you can still catch some browns, you know, here in the spring, too. Um, now, the fishing will a lot of times be a little bit slow because the water warms very slowly in tailwater. Um, so right now it's about 45 degrees. So different than the James. I mean, you know, we've had some pretty warm weather this February and early March and, you know, we're already up to 52 degrees, I think, which is very warm uh, for early uh, or early spring or, or late winter rather. Um, you know, and you could have a four or five degree jump in one day with the Jackson, you know, it takes days. To, to move the temperature on, on that water. Um, so as we, as we get close to 48 degrees, um, that's when it's really going to start to turn on good. So, and, and, you know, what's cool about the Jackson is you can go out there in the middle of the summer, as long as you have good water levels and, you know, you're fishing 56, 58 degree water. So, <laughs> and that's when you can really catch numbers of fish. So just like, you know, musky and smallmouth early season, it's more about size, you know, than it is about quantity. You get into the you know warmer months, it's going to be more about the quantity. But you can still catch some some big trout in the summertime, and then you know it kind of it, it kind of changes again you know, as you go into the fall. It's more about I mean you can catch some. We've caught some bruiser brown trout, you know, in October and right into November, right up to till Thanksgiving. Wow, that is that's so freaking cool. Now, is the whole Jackson River with that? Would that be considered all tail race waters and, and you fish it the same way? Or as it gets closer to the James, does it become more like a typical river when it comes to water temperatures during the time of year? So example yeah. is... Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say. So example is, like you said, closer to the dam, it's going to have this this um, almost this retardation in the temperature levels where you're going to be into late spring before it really warms up. How much of that affects your patterning? when it goes into the James and it dumps into the James, is that going to stagnate all the pre-spawn? Yeah, well, so once you get past the West Vaco paper plant in Covington, which is 18 miles downstream, it, it really turns into a smallmouth stream. Um, now, some of those trout will, will get past there and survive, especially, okay. you know, in the earlier months. But as you get into, uh, you know, the warmer months, you know, they're going to start retreating up the river a little bit. 
and find the you know more comfortable water. But um, the from from the paper plant in, in Covington there at West Vaco to the confluence of the uh, the Cow Pasture River that creates the James, um, that is believe it or not that is prolific smallmouth water. Really? Um, it, oh yeah, and it's kind of like the old days of the James um, back in the eighties and nineties where. Um, it's, 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 it's possible to have a hundred fish smallmouth day on the Jackson river. Um, and it's funny because the Jackson river from way back, you know, going back, you know, back into the, the forties and the fifties and the sixties, you know, when, you know, water quality wasn't, uh, at, at a, at a premium like it is today, a lot of, there's a lot of local people that call that it still to this day call the Jackson river, the dirty Jackson because the paper plant used to dump a lot of chemicals and you know whatever into the river and, and it's funny because you have people still today saying i'm not fishing in there i'm not going to eat any fish out of there and i and i probably wouldn't eat any fish out of there either uh past the the paper plant the water does have a bit of a tannic uh color because of the influence of the paper plant but being being dirty water is the furthest from the truth the jackson is an absolutely beautiful river um and the smallmouth population are absolutely insane in there and we've had many days of 100 100 I and mean, we've had 113 fish day last year we had 115 fish day we had multiple 70s 80s and 90 fish days i mean the fish generally aren't as big as what you might catch on the james and the mari but if you want to catch a lot of fish and have a, a fun day of fishing uh, you can you can catch a heck of a lot of fish on the jackson is there a um and this is a side note is does the riverkeeper organization monitor the jackson and the paper mill plant and the water quality up that far uh absolutely yes uh I, you know i don't know the details of it but i do know that the epa has some very strict regulations on the paper plant and, and you know some guys that i've talked to that have worked there said very very strict i we, i live um, my whole life next to the Shenandoah River. And so I was here for that whole debacle when we had the major fish kill. Yeah. And I talked to, we've had both river keepers on for the Shenandoah, you know, past and present. And I just think it's fascinating with with this plant right here. Like what that's, I mean, it's, clearly it's gotten better, of course, but like that is insane that that is literally, and it, guys, I just, I had it up on the thing. The paper plant is like literally right there, right smack dab on the river. That's yeah. absolutely insane. And it's, it's a monolith. It's one of the biggest facilities I've ever seen in my life. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's massive. But, you know, I, I say that, you know, the, the, the general um, size of the fish are smaller than the, the, the James and the, and the Mari. But uh, the fit, we have been getting some quality fish. Uh, I, had, I had several four-pound fish last year. And I had one that I estimated at five. And the guy was a, a bit of a novice fisherman. And unfortunately, it got off. But that, that was a huge fish. Wow. So, so they're growing up in there. And, and then, oh, continue, sorry. And, and, they, and, and because of that, that stigma or that stereotype of the Dirty Jackson, I rarely ever see anyone out there fishing, ever. That's so it crazy. gets no pressure. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, that's good, though, because it, like, it almost is healing itself sure. from what, what happened in the past. Yep. So, and then this is a great little segue to, I guess, the smallmouth pre-spawn and the musky pre-spawn, correct? Yep, yep. Um, so we've started, uh, we've started musky fishing, been out uh, a handful of times um, uh, next week or the following week. I mean, it's going to like, it's going to be like absolute craziness for me uh, here before long. But uh, musky spawn right around 49, 50 degrees uh, in that range. So we've probably got another week or two. Um, I'm thinking with the warmer weather now, this week's supposed to be a little cooler, so it might slow it down a little bit, but, uh, they could end up spawning a little bit early this year. So it's been a little bit hit and miss. We put one in the boat on Wednesday, on Thursday, we had, uh, two near misses, um, fish that swiped really close to the boat and missed those, um, wasn't out yesterday because, you know, it just rained like crazy here. I don't know about where you are, but it, it rained most of the day here. Very cold. I mean, it was like in the 40s yesterday. Not out today, obviously. Uh, we're, we're having wind gusts up to 50 miles an hour today. Uh, sustained 20, 30 mile an hour wind. So uh, probably back on the river on Tuesday. I've got somebody kind of waiting in the wings. But 
yeah, we're in musky pre-spawn, which means, uh, you know, the females, uh, if you're going to catch, uh, you know, if you're looking to catch a fish of a lifetime, you know, now is the time to do it, you know, in the next say 10 days or so, um, depending on when they spawn. Um, and then they go through what we call musky fog. You know, they, when they, they drop their eggs, um, they're guarding the nest and, and, you know, uh, once it, it, it's going to take them about, cause it's, you know, it's a very, it, there's a lot of, the very physical nature to that process, a lot of energy, they spend a lot of energy. So they're going to really be down for about three weeks or so. And then come first, the second week in April, they'll start to rebound and, uh, uh, musky become very, very opportunistic between uh, the middle of April to the middle of June when and when the water gets to about 75 degrees is when we stop fishing for them um, because it can be dangerous to catch a musky in hot water. They get a, a lactic acid build up in their muscles. And um, I mean, they'll that, that's a fish that will literally will fight you to their death. Um, it, it's crazy at how. I don't even know how to, how to, how do I, how am I going to say this? People are very, very good at protecting muskie. It's insane. Like there are so many other species. Like an example is like, I, I talked to uh, a couple episodes ago, I talked to the head chief fisheries for Virginia and, and we just had a, a very off camera conversation about the walleye and, and we compared like walleye and muskie where walleye fisheries get pounded from people taking out, but musky fishermen in general are, are generically so good at, at preserving the fish quality and making sure each fish is handled with care. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think there's a couple things. One musky are not the best table fare where walleye, mm -hmm. you know, there's not, in my opinion, it's one of the top eating fish in fresh water. And then, you know, musky can live to some, you know, like uh, that 42 inch fish we caught the other day, uh, probably 13, 14 years old. Um, the 54 inch we caught last year, probably approaching 20 years old. So I think a lot of guides like myself and avid musky fishermen, uh, you know, to your point, are very protective of those fish. And we want those fish to be able to die on their own terms. Well, okay, let's do this. Like, Who, who do you think is better? Or not not we'll reword this differently between trout and musky anglers. I feel like almost musky anglers do a better job of making sure that they handle each fish with care. Is that too far off? Because I, I, I think it's a positive that mu there's not as many musky in a fishery per trout. And yet every person I've ever talked to about musky, most of them always talk about conservation. I, I very rarely hear somebody talk about mishandling the fish. And that's really cool to yeah. see that for a, cl a, a cult that is the musky fisherman. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, you know, a lot of people do take care of uh, a trout because they can perish uh, as well. Um, but with musky, they they have a slime on them that there's a, a protective slime. Hmm. It's always a good idea when you catch a musky before you handle it to wipe your hands, so you can you know uh, you don't you don't compromise that slime on the fish. And then because of the hard, I mean you know smallmouth musky trout are all hard fighting fish. But musky are, are an apex predator. They're almost more like an animal than they are a fish. Um, so, you know, when you're turning a, a musky loose, you know, you're, you're gently putting it in the water. You're holding it by the tail. You know, you're really trying to revive the fish. Whereas, you know, yeah, a lot of people are very protective with trout as well, especially in the net, not holding them. But usually, you know, they just kind of, you know, you don't really, you're not really reviving a trout so much. You're just kind of plopping it back in the water. Uh, so I, I would absolutely agree with you, at least in my opinion and my experience and the people I've been around. And, and guys, because I can already hear people typing on the keyboards when this thing drops. I am not saying trout fishermen do not take care of trout. I am just trying to highlight how amazing the musky anglers are. And the only one that you could really compare it to is trout anglers who also generally take good care of their fish. And then again, like look at bass guys, they just yank it, throw it in the live well. So that's not a good comp, you know, comparison. So trout anglers are the only ones you could possibly compare it to when it comes to conservation, I think. Yeah. And then, you know, to answer your question about the, the, the smallmouth pre spawn, I mean, smallmouth have started to bite. Um, you know, 48 is kind of the magic number there, too. Um, you know, 52, you know, we're starting to get into some good, some good water temperatures for, and, and, you know, again, it's a lot like, you know, uh, the musky, you know, catching a fish of a lifetime, a female. Uh, we boated a six pound, 24 inch fish last year at the end of March. Um, several five pound fish, uh, lots of fours. Um, you know, not so much on the Jackson to catch those fish, but definitely on the upper James. And, you know, and, and 
a, a river that a, a lot of people don't talk about and i guess i'm a little hesitant to talk about it but uh you know the mari i, th I think people know about the mari but the mari is a very very underrated stream um and i think a lot of people's thought process is bigger river bigger fish mm -hmm. um not always true um the stretch of river i fish and i fish a lot of the stretches of the mari but um have if you're familiar with the remnants of the old kanawa canal system um there are in this one stretch of the river that I fish uh, on the Mari, there are four remnants, which makes it very, very tricky. And, you know, there's some gnarly rapids around those remnants too. And, you know, it, it keeps a lot of, uh, a lot of fishermen, I think off the river, just because, uh, you know, out, out of caution and maybe a little fear. How the hell do you like, I'm just like, cause I guys got, I, you don't know on my fourth monitor, I have like Google earth. There is so much water. Where do you where do you live and how far are you commuting for these trips? Because this is insane. This is not like you're like you guide on a lake that you live next to. Like yeah. these are so many drop zones that you have to like organize. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem that far. I mean, I live in Eagle Rock. Um, OK, you know, to get to to get to uh, Buena Vista uh, where I put in on the Mari or uh, Glasgow, you know, I put in on the James. Uh, but then I fish up here. I mean, you know, the Jackson is above my house up in Clifton Forge and Covington. Um, and then, you know, I fish right behind my house. There's an access at, at Craig's Creek and there's one down in Gala. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't seem that far for me. You know, I'm used to getting up early, you know, having grown up, you know, playing sports and especially playing hockey. I mean, you have to get up early, get ice time. So it's, it's really second nature to me. You know, get up at four o'clock on the road and get to the boat ramp and you're ready to go. So I, I don't really think a whole lot about it. For the um for the smallmouth fishing in particular, if somebody wants to do a, a trip with you, what would the best time be? Would that be the same time as the muskie and as the trout, or would would you say that there's a specific time zone coming up that they should book a trip? Yeah, it's a little different because you know once the it it, it, it kind of ebbs and flows with the the, the 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 three species, which is really cool. So it always always kind of gives us you know something to target. Um, just as the muskie are kind of going into spawn is when the smallmouth are really coming on. So we'll kind of leave the muskie alone once they, you know, they drop their eggs. So about the, you know, next week or two, depending on weather and water, is when the smallmouth are really going to heat up. And they will go until uh, in that pre-spawn until about the middle of April or so. Uh, so I'd say, you know, if you're, if you're really after the fish of a lifetime, uh, pre-spawn fish, middle of March to the middle of April, maybe, maybe to the end of April. It depends. You know, it's not like somebody flips the switch and, and all the fish spawn at the same time. You know, it, it varies. So you can still be fishing out there until late April, 1st of May. And some fish may have not spawned. Some might have spawned early and then, you know, some might be coming out of spawn. And then, you know, we'll have a period just like the muskie where, you know, it'll 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 go down a little bit. Muskie are going to be coming out of spawn middle April. And then the, the smallmouth come out of spawn uh, the middle of May and the post spawn from the middle of May until the end of June is absolute just craziness. That's that's when, if you're looking to get numbers of fish, and through the summer can be really good too, but you know, it can get really hot in July and August. You start to get, you know, some low water, but middle of May to middle of June, not only is great, uh, you know, post spawn, lots of numbers of fish, you can still get some quality fish, but also you get a really good top water bite during that period of time. And that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> top water is great. And then, once we get into later, like last year, fall came on a little bit early. We had some, we had some really cool mornings in September, so we were able to start musky fishing a little earlier last year than we would, you know, with that water temperature dropping back down below seventy-five. And, you know, once you get into fall, it's all three. I mean, it's it's game on for trout, musky, and smallmouth. And in particular, for me, my opinion, fall that's my favorite time because. The attitudes of fish change in the spring. Um, you know, it's getting warm. The fish are mating. They're all happy. It's happy time. You know, it's, you know, and, and, you know, they're starting to get active and they're starting to eat and, you know, they're going to, they're going to mate and all that stuff. In the fall, all three of those species just get a nasty disposition and attitude about them because they all know what's coming. Days are getting shorter. Food supply is getting shorter. Day, you know, days are getting colder. 
And the the fight in a musky and a smallmouth and trout in the fall are just, to me, in my opinion, that is the best time because you've got all three species. You've got, you know, the fall colors coming out. It's just a wonder. It's just a wonderful time. Well, Rob, yeah, we're definitely gonna have you on before then because I also want to talk uh, when the season comes about like uh fall brown trout fishing as well um when that starts getting heating up so we'll definitely have you back on to kind of hype up that season as well um I, i'd be remiss to ask you so where, where i'm located we have the upper potomac the shenandoah and the susquehanna oh yeah you're in a great spot yeah a little bit wider rivers a lot mm -hmm. of jet boat activity a lot of pressure from that type of recreation when you're out there is it mostly just drift boats and kayaks is there a lot of jet boat pressure down that way uh, in some areas, but you know, one of the things, and I'm glad you asked that question because one of, uh, I think my niche and even my clients have kind of picked up on this. My niche is where is I'm willing to go and want to go where others don't. Um, so there's a float, uh, in Glasgow, uh, where you actually put in on the Maria river and you float down through the James river gorge. And, oh, wow. uh, and we call that float balcony falls. Um, you know, the, the, the highlight on that, that float is class three balcony falls. And then just a little bit further downstream from class three balcony, you have little balcony, uh, probably a mile downstream for there, from there, both class three rapids. No, no way you get jet boats in there. Um, wow. so yeah, for me, you know, I've got a 15 foot, uh, Rocky mountain raft and, uh, and I find in all the years, I mean, this, I've been fishing these rivers for 40 years now, that that's not the only place where you're going to find big smallmouth, but the bigger smallmouth are more willing and, and mm -hmm. maybe a little easier to catch maybe than they are where, you know, like, like behind my house, it gets hit pretty hard. Um, the Eagle Rock float is a very long stretch of river between access points, lots of deep, slow water. Very, very, very good for jet boats. So that does get some jet boat pressure um, uh, down there near Buchanan um, because of the proximity to I-81. And uh, there's Twin River Outfitters down there, which I know those guys really well. They're great. They do a great job. People love them down there. But they're a library that they rent canoes and kayaks. So, you know, from Horseshoe Bend, um, say, to Arcadia, gets a lot of fishing pressure, especially when it gets warm. Not necessarily now. I mean, right now is a great time to fish in those areas, but um, gets a lot of pressure because of the proximity to 81 and, you know, the jet boats. Um, so, you know, I fish, a lot of my fishing is, you know, way up on the James and the Jackson and then way down on the, on the James. And then on the Maya River, really hard to, for anybody. I've seen one jet boat in there, but the water was up pretty high. But generally speaking, I think I, well, I think that's the only jet boat I've seen in there in 40 years. So for, for the people at home that don't know, just to give a, a, a visual idea, the Jackson and the Mari, for example, um, let's use baseball dimensions. Is it like 90 feet wide, which would be like from home plate to first base? Is it is it wider than that? Like uh, gen generally speaking? Yeah, it's wider than that. I would say, you know, in some places you on the Jackson and the, the Mari, you can cast to both sides oh, sitting wow. in the middle. I would say more like probably 30 yards wide. Okay. But now where I fish down at, uh, in the gorge, uh, down in Glasgow, I mean, the river down there in some places is half a mile wide. I mean, it's super wide down there. And, and, and you know, again, a lot of places I go don't get a lot of pressure. And, you know, my clients have noticed that as well, that like, man, it's so surprising that, you know, you never see anybody out here. Well, and that's the thing with a lot of these rivers, people don't understand. It's like the new river. It, it, I'll use that as an example. It's like, it's just there. You can't put a big jet boat in there. It's hard to have access. And so because of how rural it is and wild, it protects it almost. Yeah, it is so, a lot. That's that's similar to here. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, and, and that was like, I guess my last big question is like for, for, for guiding and then also like muskies too and things like that. Is there a lot of pressure and competition between you and other guide services and recreational anglers or is it you guys there's enough space for you guys to kind of space out yeah there's enough guides i think you know i'm unique in the fact that i do all three species there's not a lot of guides that do all three mm. you know there's there's guides that do like primarily musky and then they'll do smallmouth when the musky are uh spawning or you know when the water gets hot in the summer and then uh there's a guy, there's a guide out of Roanoke that 
uh, he, he's he's pretty good too. Uh, uh, Ken Trail, um, he does a lot of Smith Mountain stripers. Um, he does you know a, a muskie on the James, that's smallmouth on the James. So he does some multiple species as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean there, there's there's enough space, especially because you know when the places I go, I rarely see those guys. Um, and, and you know, and where they go, you know, they don't get a lot. But um, one of the things I have noticed uh, because the, the James is getting a lot more notoriety, I think, I think in some publications it's now been ranked as the number one musky river in the United States. Um, I'm seeing license plates from Michigan, from Minnesota. Um, I've actually had people book trips from those traditional places, and it's funny. I had. Uh, 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 a guy and a girl last year, boyfriend and girlfriend. I actually worked with the girl um, when I was working at the manufacturing company and she, she worked out of our Minnesota plant. Um, mm. And, and she told me a story about telling her friends, she heard her boyfriend, big outdoorsman, big fisherman, small mouth, musky, and they live in Minnesota. And, and they were telling their friends, they were going down to Virginia to small mouth fish and musky fish. And they're like, are there even musky down there? And you're going all that way and we've got all these fish here and they, they, they fished with me for three days and they, they did great. They caught one muskie that was 46 and in three days, they probably caught a hundred smallmouth. That is so much fun. That is awesome. <laughs> like, and, and then, so, I mean, that kind of answers that question. And so, cause a lot of people get very territorial, they're musky, rightfully so there's yes. not as many musky in a place compared to trout and smallmouth. Um, but so, when you're guiding, you're not having this issue where people are like on top of each other, generally speaking, which is, which is good to hear. Cause I know that's something that the rumor mill is it's already being taxed and, but there's just so much water down that way. It's insane. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, from here down to where I fish, uh, uh, in Glasgow, you know, that's 60 miles of river. Um, the Mari, there's a, the, the Mari is only about 42 miles long. Um, it starts out at the headwaters. It's it's stock trout water. So once you get down past Goshen, um, it becomes smallmouth. But generally have about 30 to 35 miles of smallmouth water up there. Uh, there's one other guide, I think, that just started maybe last year. Um, and they're fishing out of kayaks uh, on, on the on the on the on uh, the Mari River. And I don't experience anyone, any other guides on the Jackson at all. Wow. That's freaking awesome, dude. And again, and again, guys, like always, like link in the episode description to everything. So if you want to when you want to book a uh, trip with Rob, uh, that'll be there. Link in there to everything, all the social media. Um, if somebody wanted to expect to go out musky fishing with you, and this is something I really want to hit home with people. Um, it is not like many different types of fishing where you can go out there and guarantee success. And I think this is where social media lies to people where you go to Blue Ridge Muskie Instagram and there's a muskie every day and it's like perfect world. Yeah, you catch one your first time. However, it does have the name fish of 10,000 casts. Like, so right. if somebody wants to go out with you for the first time, like, should they try to book separate, like a, like two days in a row or is there just a time or what, what expectations should people have for their first muskie trip? Um, well, that's a great question because just the other day I had uh, a father and son, they, they fished smallmouth with me last year. They had a great day. They had like 40 smallmouth and, you know, they heard me talk about musky and, you know, and they, they booked a trip. We went the other day. They, they were the ones that had two near misses. And he said, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you set, um, you set expectations that were realistic and, you know, you, you, uh, it, because I told them a good day of musky fishing is catching one fish. And sometimes a good day of musky fishing is having follows or getting a couple swipes. Um, now we've had days where we, you know, we had a day last year where we had 17 follows and, 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 and of those we had, we put four in the fish or four fish in the boat. That was a very, very unique day. I felt like I should have gone and played the lottery that day. Uh, it was such a great day, but um now I will say I'm, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a, a little bit of a plug to my partner, uh, Go Dennis, Dennis Perko. Um, Dennis uh, is an artist, and and he started making musky baits uh, a little over a year ago. Hmm. Um, and and uh, he grew up he grew up in this area, fly fishing, tide flies. Went to a pretty prestigious uh, art school up in Massachusetts, and uh, fished you know stripers, uh, uh, saltwater stripers up there. And about a year and a half ago, he, he, he got the idea of starting to make uh, musky baits. And um, 
uh, I mean, these things are like a work of art. And, and, and without, this is not an exaggeration. Since we started using his baits, our success rate has gone up to probably around 70%. Do you have some to show off by chance? Oh man, I was going. I was going to. Um, if you give me a second, I can run down in my tackle box. Go for it. Yeah. All right. So he, he's uh, Dennis has created these uh, swim baits, and um, well, this this first one. You see this one right here. This is a a rock bass pattern. Perfect. And this one is called a pickpocket. Hmm. Um, and you see the this. Uh, this joint that it has in it and, and it's, it's a glide bait. And so basically you, you kind of pump the reel and this thing will kind of glide off and, and it does a real kind of a hard cut, but depending on the angle that he's created on these lures will be how, how tight that turn is. This one doesn't have a real tight um, joint in it. So it's got a little wider radius. I'll show you one that has, this is, this is probably my favorite of all the ones he's made. This is a, a smallmouth bass, which. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, this thing is beautiful. Same thing, but you can see this ha this has a much wider. Um, okay, it's going to give you a bigger S. Yeah. A bigger bow when you no, jerk no, it. No, this, this one's actually going to be a shorter one. Oh, really? Yeah, the other one with, with the smaller angle is actually going to be the wider. And this one's going to turn a lot. This one will actually just almost come back at you at 90 degrees. Oh, wow. And um, it's that erratic action, just like a jerkbait sort of, that gets the fish's attention. Um, here's one uh, kind of in a, in a sucker pattern. Another, another one that's called the pickpocket. Hmm. Um, here's a smallmouth that's a little greener in nature. And, and what are the sizes of these? Just for compare, you said five inches? Uh, no, these are uh, seven to eight inches right here. Seven, eight. Okay, he cool. makes them up to 12. Oh, wow. Um, this is one of my favorites, and you can see. We've probably caught, uh, we've probably caught seven or eight fish off this one. You can see how banged up this one is. Paint. This one is actually called the grid search. So it's multiple. It's got multiple joints in it. Wow. And this thing really looks real when it swims in the water. And I actually, it was me that came up with this pattern here. It's a kind of a brown and a gold. Uh, if you've ever heard of a Mad Tom. Yes. Baby catfish. Man, this thing right here, you can see the tail's been knocked off of it. <laughs> this thing, this thing has really uh, earned, earned its money. And then uh, here's one that's a hellbender. Same, uh, that's the same, a little bit brighter, you know, maybe for some, a little bit more stained water. Um, and another, uh, if you've heard of the Virginia, the fall fish, which is uh, heavy so for, cool. forage for, it's, it's a member of the sucker family, but you know, that's musky candy. This one kind of mimics a, uh, mm. uh, a fall fish. So, but yeah, per Perco lures. And thank you for allowing me to do that. No, ab absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, that's why I'm here is to help promote, uh, all, all you local bait makers and guides. So with that said, with, with that, um, if people wanted to purchase that again, guys, I'll make sure I get uh, from Rob a link in the episode description. So link in the episode description below to all these baits. Uh, and hopefully we can have him on as well in the future sometime. And he can talk about it more in depth. Uh, what size gear do you need to be throwing those baits or what does you suggest? Yeah, I use uh, anywhere from a seven and a half foot to eight foot uh, heavy action musky rod, um, 80 pound braid and 80 pound fluorocarbon leader. Um, I've always stayed. I, I like the fluorocarbon leaders because I think they, you know, allow for better action, especially with these swim baits and these glide baits, you know, being able to go, you know, back and forth. I think wire sometimes inhibits the action a little bit on the bait. Um, I've never had a muskie either break one when we've hooked it up or a client. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much our, our main setup. Um, but like I said, well, I've got some of these that are bigger and I've got some that are, uh, this is probably the smallest one right here, this little hellbender. This one might be six inches right here. And we've actually even caught some bass on this one. Do you guys, hellbender is such an interesting idea to make a bait on. Um, yeah. How did that come? I need how did that come about? Do you have a lot of hellbenders down that way? Uh, we have some. Um, you know, you know, uh, I think they're they're they they're part of the salamanders, and um, you know, they we you know when the uh, spring lizards you know get out in the in the creeks and in the streams. I mean, they're they're forage for every everything. I mean, we've caught musky you know accidentally bass fishing 
with a zoom, you know, four or six inch lizard. So that keyed me in on, well, they're eating those too. Um, so, you know, we, we've, we've experimented with that color and we've caught them on that one as well. Now are glide baits, generally speaking, your primary go-to 12 months out of the year for muskie, or is that more of a spring, uh, pre-spawn bait? Um, I, I've been using these, I've been, I've caught fish all year long, winter, okay. spring and fall. Gotcha. Um, and since he started making these baits, you know, and you know, he's, you know, a really good friend of mine. Um, you know, I, I, I have, I probably use these baits about 80% of the time now, if not more. That's awesome. Okay. And then guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today. Um, yeah, we talked about, I don't even think we brought this up yet, but the boat that you have, like, yep. is that custom? What do you use? Yeah, it's a 15 foot uh, Rocky Mountain raft with a, a with an NRS frame. Um, and I've got a standing platform in the front and the back so people can stand up and fish or you know, they can sit down and fish. Uh, it handles, you know, the water very well. Um, you know, I've had it in class four rapids before, never got anything higher than that, but uh, very stable. Um, you know, and, you know, you, we were talking about the, the musky guides with the jet boats. I don't have a jet boat, um, you know, and, and there's advantages and disadvantages to, uh, you know, both both ways. Uh, uh, you know, for me, I like I like I like the simplicity and the serenity of not having a motor. You know, it's a lot of work for me, yeah. but <laughs> I'm used to it. Um, but I also think fishing out of a raft forces you to fish the river harder. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, and, and I'm not, you know, no disrespect to the jet boat guys at all. They're, they're, there's some good ones around here and they're great guides. Um, but I, I, I observe them a lot of times, you know, they'll come zooming down the river, they'll hit a spot, they'll be on the spot for five minutes and they pick it up and just, you know, they're gone again. And, you know, we're methodically working our way down the stream, you know, because, you know, once you put in, you can't go back to where you put in. You've got to go to where you're taking out. Um, so we want to fish the river really hard. And I think that's, you know, that's a benefit for the style of fishing I do. Especially in the places that, that you, it, it allows you to have access to so many other places. Uh, but that's also good for people to know that like, so if they want to go out with you, what they're dealing with, uh, a raft situation, I've been out on them. They're very stable platforms, a lot of fun. Um, it's actually shockingly the first time this past winter, I actually went out with Travis Eden, Kingfisher Guide Services on, on a raft. And I was surprised at how sturdy of a platform that is. It does, when you think raft, it, you're mentally not prepared for what type of raft. When someone says raft, you're thinking maybe of an inflatable Walmart mattress. Yeah. No, this <laughs> thing is, they're bulletproof. They're stable. You get on it and it doesn't move. It's right. very surprising about how sturdy of a platform they are. Yep. Yeah. My, my, most of my clients really enjoy it. Um, and, you know, like I said, they, a lot of them, a lot of them, and it's, it, you know, just this, this week, you know, a couple of the clients that I had, you know, just said, you know, so nice. So the the one that I had that just had the two near misses, they actually live up in uh, north of Charlotte, North Carolina on Lake Norman, if you've ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, boats going all the time. And I said, you know, it's so nice to be out of your fishing, not hear any motors, not see anybody else. We were the only people on the river all day. So I, I get I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of compliments about that. And then I guess the last thing we already touched on the muskie um, for your uh, pre-spawn spawn mouth. If you had to pick a handful of baits, um, you don't have to give away all the juice, but what would you suggest people try to use this time of year? Um, well, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people are familiar now with the Ned rig. Yeah. Um, a few. <laughs> I, and I use a, a, ver, a, a, a slightly different variation of the Ned rig, um, which in my opinion is the best small mate, the small mouth bait I've ever used. It's called a Z-Man micro finesse jig and it's i i when the when the water is you know uh if, if we've got a a normal flow or slightly less than normal flow i go with an eight ounce um i go with three sixteenths if it's just a little higher um and then i actually attach the the ned ned worm to that micro finesse jig and man I, it's it's, it's, it's been insane. It's been unreal. We've caught more citation, you know, off that little, off that little bait this big, probably than any other bait that we've ever used. And I, peanut butter and jelly seems to be a great color. Um, yeah. and then there's the copper truce. That's another good one. I, I always have shocked about that, that how black and blue peanut butter and jelly, these darker colors on these cleaner rivers work so freaking well because I know. it shouldn't mentally, I, it should not work, but it does. I know. Yeah. Um, 
uh, crankbait, uh, bandit, bandit, uh, baits makes a, a bait called, um, a 100 series. It's a, it's a square bill for the most part. When I'm using crankbaits, I always go a square bill for smallmouth. Uh, they have one that's, uh, uh, orange. It's called uh, crawfish with the orange belly. Great, hmm. gr- great bait, especially if you have a little bit of stain in the water early spring. That square bill creates a wider wobble and, you know, it, it sends out that vibration that draws the fish in. Whereas you, you with a, you know, with a, with a longer, with a longer uh, bill on it, you don't quite sometimes get that, that, that wide side to side wobble. Um, I love a jerk bait. Um, you know, you can work a jerk bait all year long. I find with clients, um, you know, in the early spring, you've got that, you know, you, it's basically like a cadence of jerk, jerk, pause, jerk, jerk, pause. And, you know, when the water's cold for them to have enough patience to let that bait sit long enough. If you think you've let it set long enough, you probably need to let it set a little longer. I mean, upwards of 10, 15 seconds, um, you know, especially when it's cold. And when, when the water hmm. warms, when the water warms up, you know, post spawn, man, you can rip that thing. Jerk, jerk, pause, jerk, jerk, pause, jerk. And, you know, it's just darting all over the place. And we catch tons of fish um, in post spawn. And then even, you know, in the summertime, you know, I'll, I'll use that a lot, you know, say in the morning because fish are a lot more aggressive and they're willing to chase. Um, another bait I like to use uh, primarily early in the season and late in the season which you probably don't hear a lot of people talk about uh, when it comes to smallmouth fishing as a spinnerbait, um, mainly in cold water. I, I don't use it in the summertime. I, I can't even remember the last time I might might have used a spinnerbait in warm water. Maybe if it, the water's, you know, muddied up or something. But I like a three-eighth ounce double, uh, double willow blade. Um, in the spring, and, and this even goes to crankbaits and plastic baits, in, in the early spring, the fish haven't seen a lot of food yet. You know, just kind of coming around. Bright color. So, like on the jerkbait, I like the bubblegum pink. Uh, I'll go with bubblegum pink on a spinnerbait or chartreuse. You know, one of the things that we say, I don't know if people say it other, other places, but early spring and fall when the water's cold, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. <laughs> so, bright. That is br- interesting. Pink. I haven't heard pink in a long time. I actually picked up on that from Al Lindner watching the show. Love watching the uh, uh, Lindner's uh, angling edge. And uh, he was using bubblegum pink up in Minnesota, Minnesota early in the season, right after ice out. And I'm like, there's no way that thing can work. I mean, that is just nasty looking. So I figured, well, let me give it a try. And lo and behold, man, <laughs> they will absolutely knock the paint off of that thing in cold water, even when they're sluggish. What do you think is for smallmouth? What is more important? Is it, is it sight, sound, or smell? Like which one do you think is the most important one for a smallie? Um, I think sight. Yeah, I think sight because we talk about water clarity a lot. And, you know, the better the water clarity, you know, usually the better that the fish can hone in on something and track it down. That's why a lot of times, you know, when you're, when you've got stained water or you've got, you know, uh, dirty water, you're going to go with something that, um, you know, it's bright. But then also, you know, a spinnerbait, you know, you get that that thumping vibration. I think sound would probably be second. But smell is also important, too. Um, you know, fish has a thousand times greater sense of smell than a human does. So mm. they definitely can track in on on smell as well. That's awesome. That's good stuff. Guys, again, link in the episode description, everything we talked about. Rob, um, I, I can't thank you enough for making time out of your busy schedule to come on here. Is there anything else that we missed that, that you wanted to touch on or anything you wanted to promote? No, I just, again, I, I thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I hope folks will, will look me up. Um, give us a chance. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. I still love doing it after all these years. And um uh, I think, you know, if, if we have good weather, we're in a very good pattern right now. We've had two good, two good years of smallmouth spawns. You know, we, the smallmouth fishery has been down a little bit. Um, one of the things that, you know, we have a bit of a flathead catfish problem that that's trying to be addressed. Uh, so we had that along with some bad spawns, 18, 19 and 20, where we had some high water events that, that 
created some bad spawns along with the combination of the flatheads. So, but the last two years, I mean, we have caught, I can't tell you how many fish we've caught, you know, and that's a great sign. So uh, we're in a good cycle again. Hopefully that continues. And uh, again, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. No, absolutely. And we're definitely going to have you back on the show again, guys, again, link in the episode description. Um, we might be talking here a little bit longer, but this episode's over again, like, and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.